Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the Retro Wrestling Room. AEW have just held their monumental All Out 2021 pay-per-view and the internet and wrestling fans around the world have been going absolutely mad for it. Vince McMahon must be terrified. The WWE is over. All Out 2021 is the best pay-per-view of all time. Obviously, when looking into the wild and wacky world of Twitter and YouTube comments, you have to take each comment with a grain of salt. But one kept coming back up time and time again. All Out 2021 is the best pay-per-view of all time. Is this true? I'll leave my thoughts on the answer till the very end of the video. But could AEW, a company that has been around for three years at this point, really have put on the greatest pay-per-view of all time? And it got me thinking, what pay-per-views could people be comparing this one to? One pay-per-view for the last 20 years has been widely agreed upon to be one of the greatest pay-per-views of all time, and that is none other than WrestleMania 17. This event was held in the peak of the WWF's powers. They had just purchased WCW and ECW, its two main competitors. They filled out a huge stadium. Wrestling is still at a real boom period and it's being headlined by Stone Cold Steve Austin versus The Rock at the very height of their popularity. Could AEW really compare to this? Well, I'm going to go through the pay-per-view in its entirety and compare the most logical matches against each other and see if AEW could have done the impossible. Obviously, these are just my opinions and if yours differ, that's completely fine. We're all fans of wrestling here and different opinions are what makes the world more interesting, right? Before we get into the first match of the card though, let's look at the arena and the setup. AEW's All Out was held in front of 10,126 fans in the now arena Hoffman Estates, Illinois. And WrestleMania was held in front of 67,925 fans in the Astrodome in Houston, Texas. There isn't really any competition here, as the WWF show holds about seven times as many people in the building. It has the iconic WrestleMania and X7 logos on huge signs beside the stage. And as much as I love the AEW stage setup with the dual entrance ways, the first point undoubtedly has to go to WrestleMania X7. The commentary team at WrestleMania X7 was Jim Ross, who was really close to the top of his game here, and beside him was Paul Heyman, as Jerry the King Lawler was away from the company at the time and wouldn't come back for at least another few months after this. I always thought Paul Heyman brought out the best in Jim Ross and really kept him on his toes, pretty much as he does with everyone else he works with. On the other side we have Jim Ross who is now 20 years older and not quite in the prime of his commentary career anymore. Tony Schiavone on Play by Play and then Excalibur as well. I actually really dig this pairing and think it's probably the greatest commentary team going at the present time, but seeing Jim Ross and Paul Heyman at the peak is something that is just as special now as it was 20 years ago. Point to X7. So before we start HPVB, Let's look at the dark matches on each card. WrestleMania X7 started with a lackluster X Factor faction, which consisted of the extremely stale X Pack. I mean, there is a reason that the derogatory term is called X Pack Heat. And just incredible, this is the thrown together team of Grandmaster Sexay and Steve Blackman. Even though it was a pre show, I got, I got to wrestle at WrestleMania, so. Oh, you yeah, know. I remember that. Remember how pissed yeah. off I was? Because they purposely yeah. did that to us. AEW had a 10-man tag team match consisting of best friends, which consists of Orange Cassidy, Chuck Taylor, and Wheeler Yuta, and then Jungle Express, Jungle Boy, and Luchasaurus. And they were facing the Hardy Family Office, Matt Hardy, Private Party, and Hybrid 2. I can't imagine even the most die-hard WWF WWE fan picking the X7 match here. It only lasted 2 minutes 46 seconds and was a complete waste of time. Whereas AEW had the super over Orange Cassidy and Lucha Express in the dark match. So like I said earlier, it didn't seem right to put match 1 from WrestleMania 17 versus match 1 from AEW's All Out because some of them were nothing alike at all. 
So I've tried to match up the right matches up against their closest counterparts. And what better way than putting the two Jericho matches right up against each other? The X7 match was for the Intercontinental Championship against William Regal. Two of the best workers of the 90s clashed on the biggest stage of the year, but it's sadly seen as disappointing by most fans who expected a lot more from these two. It probably didn't help that the feud was largely based around Jericho urinating into William Regal's teapot. Yes, you did hear that right. On the other hand, Jericho's match at All Out was based all around the possibility of him not being able to wrestle in AEW anymore. MJF and Jericho are two of the very best promos in the business and are both able to build a feud like no others. The only thing that really harmed this match was the fact that they basically just seen it on a previous AEW Dynamite show within the last month of this taking place. It had a great false finish towards the end as well, where it looked like the dastardly heel had forced his greatest foe into retirement. Even though Jericho can't go quite as well as he did 20 years ago, he still managed to put on a great match with the always impeccable MJF. Point goes to AEW. The second match at X7 pitted the APA and Taz up against right to centre in a match that only lasted just shy of 4 minutes. The match had a relatively fast paced brawl which is mostly remembered for a Taz botch where he falls into the ropes after an Irish whip. The APA delivered their particularly stiff looking spine busters and body drops and even a huge belly to back suplex from the second rope. It may be a slightly forgettable match in the grand scheme of things but it should be considered an all time classic compared to the dismal Paul White vs QT Marshall matchup. Watching Paul White in 2021 it's like watching Andre the Giant in 1990. There comes a time where it's, it's just not entertaining anymore and it's just sad to watch them. Paul White delivers his trademark chops in the corner and then his choke slam finisher with literally no offense coming back at him. The reason I'm comparing these two matches is the fact that they both went under four minutes. Neither is a messy match, but the point 100% has to go to X7. The third match on X7 is a triple threat hardcore match between Kane, Raven and The Big Show. I could have put this match up against Paul White's AEW match, but it's worlds apart and nothing on All Out really matched up well to this match. It's kind of a throwback match these days, as hardcore matches that go all over the arena are mostly a relic of the late 90s. This is probably the absolute peak of those kind of matches. Does it have the best wrestling you've ever seen? Probably not. But is it one of the most fun hardcore matches you'll see? Yeah, I'd have to say so. It had Raven being thrown into a glass window, Raven being hit with a golf cart, Raven being hit with a golf cart that was comically being driven by Kane. Kane takes out both of his opponents by throwing them off the staging and lands a big dive onto them both for the win. If you like these wacky hardcore matches, like I said earlier, this is the absolute pinnacle. The next matchup we are comparing is the mid-card titles. First up is the European Championship match between Eddie Guerrero versus Test. Much like the Taz match, this match is again mostly remembered for the botch, where Test's foot gets stuck in the ropes and takes a lifetime to be freed. It's unfortunate though because these two put on quite an entertaining, hard-hitting matchup. It's not on the level of Eddie versus Angle or Eddie versus Ray. And in all honesty, this may be the worst Mania match of Eddie Guerrero's career, but that's in no way saying that this is bad. On All Out, Miro, the TNT champion, defended his title against Eddie Kingston, which consisted of huge suplexes and moves that looked straight out of AJPW from the 90s. Miro is at his absolute peak at the moment, and his current character and matches are making him look like an unstoppable force. Miro's chest was battered and bruised due to the chops and neither man held back. Miro kept his undefeated streak and won in just over 13 minutes. I feel like the run of Miro at the moment puts it slightly in the lead for me and that's why AEW gets this point. How can AEW possibly compete with Kurt Angle versus Chris Benoit? the two very best workers in the world at the time and are on a lot of people's Mount Rushmore? Well, they invite over Satoshi Kojima from Japan, the first man to hold the New Japan's IWGP Championship as well as All Japan's Triple Crown at the very same time. Would this be enough? 
in a word, no. But it's not through the lack of trying. Angle and Benoit had an immeasurable amount of chemistry in the ring and they more than delivered on this night. A near faultless 15 minute match between the two best technical wrestlers in the world. The build was short and simple coming into this match. Benoit thinks he's the best wrestler. Kurt Angle thinks he's the best wrestler. Let's find out who really is. Satoshi Kojima is 50 years old. No, that's not a mistake. How is he still this good at 50 is a near miracle. He was going up against John Moxley, one of the most rounded wrestlers in the world, and it was always going to be great, but it wasn't ever really going to be hot enough to compete with the X7 counterpart. Point goes to WrestleMania 17. The most obvious comparison on this list, and in fact the easiest to score, is the female world title matches on each card. At WrestleMania 17, China faced off against Right to Sensor's Ivory in a bid to win back his title, in which, in actuality, was just a squash match. The build had been going on for months, where China suffered a neck injury and was weakened going into the match. China wiped the floor with Ivory and the blow off pretty much to a lacklustre feud. AEW, on the other hand, had an unbelievable women's title match in which Britt Baker successfully defended her title against Chris Statlander. This had it all. Delayed vertical suplexes off the second rope, crushing DDTs, 450s, curb stomps on the outside, Canadian destroyers and amazing character work from Britt Baker. A fantastic match that, if I could, I'd give it two points. One of the least expected triumphs of X7 was the McMahon family feud. Neither of them are full-time competitors, but they put it all out there on this night and the storytelling was magnificent. Nothing on the All Out card really matched up with this match to compare it to, and it was such a fun match that X7 has to get the deserved spot here. It may be overbooked with the whole Linda McMahon storyline and Trish Stratus, but it's such a fun match that still holds up to this very day. Shane manages to pull out the bag big spots like the Coast to Coast, and even though Vince isn't the most athletic person, to put it kindly, his character work and ability to get somebody else over is second to none. A must-see from this card. Now this one is very hard for me. God, these two brilliant matches. TLC2 versus what Dave Meltzer has described as possibly the greatest steel cage match that he has ever seen. I think it's fair to say that these are the two matches that stole the show on both of these shows. TLC2 was a rematch in the previous summer and a slight tweak on the match that these teams had at the previous year's WrestleMania. They were the three most iconic teams of that era going all out, excuse the pun there, to put on the most innovating, groundbreaking match that they could muster up. The fact that they had already set the bar so high with their previous efforts and were still able to go to another level is absolutely mind-blowing. People still go crazy about the thought of this match 20 years on and it is the absolute benchmark for any type of ladder or TLC match that has happened since. Then, on the other hand, we have this cage match that's now being lauded as not just being one of the best cage matches of all time, but as being one of the best tag team matches of all time. They both have insane high spots and near falls, but TLC has managed to stay at the highest level for 20 years now. It was the peak of tag wrestling at the time, so even though AEW had a near flawless match, my head tells me to edge it towards the X7 match. But if you get the chance, watch both of these matches as many times as you possibly can and treasure them for the gems that they really are. Now let's pit the two battle royals against each other. The gimmick battle royal, the Marmite match of X7. People seem to either love this match or detest it. I think I loved it at the time and was so excited to see all the guest appearances and we have Mean Gene and Bobby the Brain Heenan on commentary. But has it stood the test of time? Does anybody really want to watch this match more than once in their lifetime? The Casino Battle Royal, even though not perfect, features some of the best wrestlers in the world former champions in Riho and Shida, powerhouses like Nyla Rose and Jade Cargill, Dastardly Heels, the debut of Ruby Soho, which was one of the moments that absolutely blew the roof off. 
and it tried its hardest to put every single person in the match over. One of the easiest matches to judge on this list for me. Point goes to AEW. WrestleMania X7 had the first of three matches that The Undertaker and Triple H would have against each other on the grandest stage of them all. This was the one that was held when they were both closest to their athletic peaks. Taker was in his kind of awkward phase of not quite getting to his big evil gimmick and was already getting a bit stale with his biker gimmick. Now, I must admit, Undertaker and Triple H have never been two of my favourite wrestlers. Okay, I know that's an unpopular opinion, but it is the truth. I found Triple H to be a bit insufferable at this point in his career as well, until he came back with a purpose at the following Rumble. To me, he never had the excitement of The Rock or Austin, never had the ring skills of Shawn Michaels or Bret Hart, and dare I say it, often had quite boring matches. Saying all that though, they still put on a great match here. Far from being the best of the night, but a very good match nonetheless. It had a huge sledgehammer spot, last rides, a throw off the scaffolding, and marked the 10th win at WrestleMania for The Undertaker. Nothing in this match though, matched the excitement for me of seeing CM Punk back in the ring after seven years. He had a great comeback match against Darby Allin, which managed to put Punk over as a returning force, and Darby Allen over as someone who will keep getting better and better. It even had added hints back to how Bret Hart made the 1-2-3 kid look like a star in one of the best Monday Night Raw matches you'll ever see. So even though personally I'd give this match to Punk and Allen, I will admit the taker coming down to the ring on his Harley is a lot more impressive than Allen slowly coming down on his skateboard. What more can be said about the Austin Rock feud that culminated at this year's WrestleMania? Even people who loathed Limp Bizkit at the time loved the promo package attached to this match. This had an unbelievable big match feel and Astrodome was electric for the main event getting behind the hometown challenger. The two biggest wrestling names of all time facing off against each other in the main event for the second time. It even felt bigger than Hogan vs Warrior at the time and was guaranteed to be much better in the ring. They never disappointed. They brawled all around the ring, both busted wide open, kicking out of each other's finishes, which wasn't really the norm at the time. It still remains a highlight in both of their highly respective careers. Kenny Omega has been one of the best wrestlers in the world over the last five years, and he was going toe to toe with a veteran, Christian Cage. Even for the best bite machine, this was going to be a tall order. Even if Omega had Okada with him as a dance partner, I don't think he could have matched the magnitude of the X7 main event. He did put on a great main event, and it would probably be guarded as one of the better main events in recent history. It had table spots, comeback spots, and a huge devastating one winged angel off the top rope. It was Christian Cage's best match for years, and it showed that he can still go at the highest level, but the point has to go to Stone Cold Steve Austin versus The Rock. Now the reason why I included this separately to the main event is the actual match between Austin and Rock was brilliant, but the ending was one of the worst endings to any WrestleMania, except for maybe WrestleMania 9. It also led to one of the worst, most botched storylines in the history of not just the WWF, but in wrestling in general, and I think it would be wrong to ignore this here. They absolutely destroyed the Stone Cold character in one gesture. It was the equivalent of having Luke Skywalker go through the original trilogy as this white meat babyface, and then at the end of Return of the Jedi to join the Emperor and the credits to roll. It would just go against everything that was previously set up just to have a twist ending. All Out, however, had the best possible ending that they could have ever hoped for. The debuts of not just Adam Cole, but Brian Danielson as well. The overall feeling coming out of AEW was excitement, anticipation. The feeling coming out of X7 was disappointment and bewilderment after a near flawless show. So what's the final verdict? I think AEW got a lot closer to X7 than even their biggest supporters thought would have even been possible. 
From the top to the bottom, everyone worked their socks off to create the best possible show that they could. And when you think about it, they pulled the pack versus Andrade match, as well as not having Alistair Black versus Cody on the show, which was one of the biggest storylines at the moment. It speaks volumes. As a final send off, the WWE has struggled to come close to this pay per view over the last 20 years and AEW have done so within their very first three years. Can AEW top this pay-per-view within the next 20 years? I wouldn't bet against them. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed. Keep an eye out over the next couple of weeks for our next five-star match review, which will be Shiri vs. Utami Hayashishida, where we'll be joined by two very special guests. Please like and subscribe, as it would really help out our channel. So until next time, stay safe, be good to each other and we'll see you guys soon.